الحمد للہ وسلاۃ وسلام علی رسول اللہ وعلیٰ علی وصاب اجمعین اما آباد اعوذ باللہ من الشیطان الرجیم بسم اللہ الرحمن الرحیم و تسیم و بحبل اللہ جمیع و لطفرق رب شلی صدری و یسلی عمری وحل العدت من لسانی افق و قولی دا رسپیکٹڈ پیپل آن دا ڈائس مائی رسپیکٹڈ ایلڈرز اینڈ مائی ڈیئر بردرز اینڈ سسٹرز آئی ویلکم آل آف یو ود اسلامک گریٹنگ السلام علیکم و رحمۃ اللہ وبرکاتہ May peace, mercy, and blessings of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, of Almighty God, be on all of you. The topic of this evening's talk of mine is the importance of the unity in the Muslim Ummah. And we find today that Alhamdulillah, more than 25% of the world population, they are Muslims. There are close to 2 billion Muslims in the world today. Alhamdulillah. But the unfortunate part is that though we are in such large number, every fourth person in the world is a Muslim. In spite of these large numbers, today, the people that are troubled the most the people that are looked down upon the most today are the Muslims. The situation of the Muslims today is very pathetic. All over the world you see in Muslim countries, there is killing. People attacking the Muslim country. We find fitna in the Muslim country. Who is to blame for this situation? And why are we in this situation? If we go back to the Islamic history and we see the times of Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam and the Khulfa Rashidin and the Sahabas, the Muslims at that time were on the top of the world. From the 7th to the 10th century CE, the Europeans, they called it as the Dark Ages. But the amount of advancement that the Muslims made is phenomenal. If you wanted to do research in science, it was compulsory you had to learn Arabic as a language. Though the Europeans called it the dark age, it was dark for them. But Muslims were on top of the world. If you read the Islamic history in the first 30 years, at the time of the Khulfa Rashidin, Muslims ruled the, a large portion of the world, a major portion of the world. And before the Quran was revealed, the Arabs at that time, it was known as the Yomil Jahiliya, the days of the ignorance. The Arabs were the most ignorant people of the world. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala revealed the last and final message the glorious Quran to the last and final messenger prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam and he made this Yawm al Jahiliya these Arab who are the most ignorant people he made them the torchbearer of the world Muslims in the earlier time they were top of the world they ruled the world and the reason the Muslims were on top of the world because the Muslims at that time they were close to the Quran and Sunnah. They followed the guidance of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala given in the glorious Quran and the teachings of Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam in the authentic hadith. That's the reason the Muslims were on top of the world. And I started my talk by quoting a verse from the Quran, Quran from Surah Al Imran, chapter number 3, verse number 103, which says, Wa tasimu bi hablillai jamia wa la Hold all together strongly to the rope of Allah and be not divided. Which is the rope of Allah? The rope of Allah 
is the glorious Quran. The glorious Quran and the teachings of Prophet Muhammad in the Sahih Hadith, they are the rope of Allah. If we Muslims hold strongly together to the rope of Allah, the glorious Quran and the authentic Hadith, and if we are not divided, inshallah we'll remain on top of the world forever. Today the situation of the Muslims is because we have gone far away from the rope of Allah, from Quran and authentic Hadith. And we Muslim today are divided. We are divided amongst ourselves. It's very easy to divide the Muslims. Very easy. Give them some money and they're divided. Give them some power and they're divided. Give them some fame and they get divided. Full world you see around us. And our beloved Prophet Muhammad said that before Qiyamah, Muslim will be like froth, large numbers, like froth, no value. Today, the religion which is practiced most in the world is Islam. In number, may be Christians, but most of them don't practice. According to statistics, the religion that is followed and practiced the most in the world, number one is Islam. But look at us. We are looked down upon. People are afraid to call themselves Muslims. They are afraid to keep a beard. They are afraid to wear a cap. The situation that we Muslims are, because number one, we have gone away from Quran and Sunnah, and number two, we are divided. And this verse of Surah Tawbah chapter, verse of Surah Imran chapter 3, verse 103, after saying, Hold strongly to the rope of Allah and be not divided. It says, And remember the favors of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala that you were enemies unto one another and united your hearts. And if you read the Tafsir ibn Qasir, the Nuzil Quran, it says, How was this ayah revealed? At the time, after the battle of Hunayn, when the spoils of war, when the booty was divided, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala reveals to him وسلم, that he should give the major portion to Muallah Futu al Qulub. Those whose hearts are coming towards Islam. They were chiefs, chiefs of the Arab tribe who didn't have much faith to prevent them from going back to disbelief. Allah revealed to the Prophet that give this spoils of war to them. When the Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa gave the spoils of war, the booty, Malikanimat, to these chief Arabs, the Ansar, they were offended. They felt bad. And they started speaking among themselves that the Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, he is giving major of the wealth to his people. And there was discord. The Prophet Muhammad was patient. He kept quiet. He let the situation settle down. Then he calls the Ansar separately so that no one else is there when he addresses them. And when he gathers them separately, he asks them a question. Do you not know that you were astray and Allah guided you through me? And all the Ansar said, O oh Prophet, you and Allah are both generous. Then the Prophet said, that weren't you enemies unto one another disunited and I united all of you? All of them said, yes, you are right and you are most generous. The Prophet said, weren't you poor and I gave you wealth? All the Ansar said, the Prophet is right and most generous. So much so that the Ansar started to cry and the beards became wet. This is how our beloved Prophet Muhammad prevented a fitna, prevented disunity by reminding them the favors of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And in this verse Allah says that don't you remember that you were enemies unto one another 
and we united you trying to tell them that what I've given you is much more and they realized the mistake and they started to cry and they said Allah and his messenger are most generous here a major disunity was prevented by the beloved Prophet Muhammad disunity is one of the biggest fitna and we have several such examples and we realize that we as being human beings there were difference of opinion even among the companions of the Prophet even among the Sahabas but that does not mean that they fought with each other like today we have it's very common if I don't agree with certain thing with another Muslim you start abusing them we start cursing them today takfir is very common one Muslim calling another Muslim a kafir it's a great sin a beloved prophet said that if you call someone a kafir and if he's not a kafir that kufr that kufr return back to you it is only Allah and his Rasul who can call someone a kafir we human beings cannot unless you have hundred percent evidence from Quran and Sahih Hadith few exceptions we cannot call another believer or just because he doesn't agree with your view you start abusing him you start calling him names you disagree with him you fight with him many a times there were disagreement among the Sabas but they always stood by each other and whenever the enemy tried to take advantage there are many incidences when the Sabas disagreed an enemy tried to say okay fine you know if you want I'll help you against him and I will attack him the Sabas never allowed that they said we are Muslim brothers you dare interfere in our affair we may disagree over a matter but they never allowed any enemy of Islam any opponent to come close to any of them this was the unity and I'll give you an example about the incidents of Banu Quraida after the battle of Azab Jibril salam comes and tells Muhammad sallallahu sallam that you should attack Banu Quraida and there were three tribes that had a treaty with the Muslims the Jewish tribe and all of them betrayed the last one was Banu Quraida so Jibril salam tells Muhammad sallallahu sallam that they betrayed you go and attack so Muhammad sallallahu sallam calls the sahabas and tells them that all of you you should pray Asar in Banu Quraida this was the instruction given by the Prophet to the Sahabas that all of you pray Asar in Banu Quraida now when this instruction was given two meanings can be understood by it number one can be that all the Sahabas should pray Asar in Banu Quraida irrespective whether they reach before sunset or after sunset other people may understand that what the Prophet meant was that we should reach Banu Quraida before the end of Asar Salah. We should hurry and reach there before the end of Asar Salah. But that doesn't mean that if you are not able to reach by sunset, we don't pay Asar before that. Two meanings. And but naturally if you analyze the second meaning is more appropriate, is more correct because missing any salah deliberately is forbidden in Islam the Prophet will never ask someone to miss the salah but a person can understand this instruction in two ways the second instruction is more authentic way to be understood because the Prophet will not tell anyone to miss his first salah never you cannot miss any salah without a valid reason intentionally even in the battlefield Allah says you have to pray whether you pray walking or running or on the camel you have to pray in the battlefield one group of people pray in Jamaat the other keeps watch then the second group prays and the first keeps watch so based on all this ruling the correct understanding is the second one but person can misunderstand two ways so what happens when the Sahabas when they go towards Banu Quraida 
and they're unable to reach there before sunset. So some of them pray Asar before reaching Banu Qurayda and some of them pray Asar after sunset in Banu Qurayda. So when the Sahabas differed, both the groups went to the Prophet and asked, who's correct? Prophet asked the first group, what did you understand when I said that pray Asar in Banu Qurayda? The first group said, we thought that, okay, we have to pray Asar in Banu Qurayda, irrespective whether we reach before sunset or after sunset. Is that what you understood? They said, yes. So you prayed Asar after sunset Banu Qurayda? They said, yes. Okay, you are right. That's what you understood? You followed it right. Prophet asked the next group, what did you understand? We understood that you told us that you should reach Banu Qurayda before the end of Asar. That means before sunset. So that we can pray there. But because we could not reach and praying Asar is far, we prayed Asar before we reached Banu Qurayda. And then we reached Banu Qurayda after Asar. After sunset. The Prophet said, is this how you understood? They said, yes, you are right. The Prophet said, both are right because they understood that way. And both were doing itat of the messenger. So the Prophet said, both are right. The main intention was to obey the messenger. So if you understand wrong and yet you obey, you get your sawab. Our beloved Prophet Muhammad said that if a person does ishtihad and gives the wrong fatwa, he gets one sawa. If he gives the right fatwa, he gets two sawa. The Sahabas never fought among themselves. You are right, I am right, you are wrong, I am wrong. There was unity. Imagine in such a big issue, not praying salah intentionally is a big It is haram that if you miss a salah. Yet, the sahabas never fought. Today, we may differ. Some of us, when we go for the sujood from Kayam, we keep our hand first, then our knees. Some of them keep their knees first, and then the hand. Then they fight over it. If we differ, we fight. I am right, you are wrong. You're not a good Muslim. You're doing bida. You're doing kuf. This is against Islam. Disrupting the unity of the Muslim ummah, we have to agree to disagree. It is not a matter of for the haram. Irrespective whether you put your hand first or knee first, will, will your salah be accepted or not? Of course it will be. It is not the question of that salah will not be accepted. So why you have to fight over it? In some parts of India, people even literally have fist fight. They even kill each other for these small issues. When we go in Ruku, and after Ruku when we come and we say, Tamiya Allah alimna hamidna rabbana ala kalam hamdan kaseeran tayyabin warakan fi. Some of them keep the hands on the chest. After getting for Ruku, some keep it at the side. According to the first three Aymas, Imam Abu Hanifa, Imam Shafi, Imam Malik, Imam Shafi, they said keep it on the side. Imam Ibn Hanbal said keep it on the chest. Both of them believe in the Hadith says keep the hands where they were before. After you get up from the Ruku, keep your hands where they were before. Some scholars thought, that keep the hands where they were before you started the salah. So they kept the hand here. One understanding. Some understood, keep the hands where they were before you went into ruku. And they keep it here. I may follow one particular thing. I don't fight with the other view. These are small issues. Where you keep your hand when you get up from the ruku. And the scholars at that, at that time, all, all the four great Ayyamas, they were great scholars. They respected each other's view, even if they differed. Today, we cannot tolerate it. And if you see besides you, your person praying next to you is putting his hand first 
and you prefer putting your knee first while going for sujood, then full time you'll be thinking, oh, that time is wrong. You're not concentrating on Allah. You're concentrating on the person next to you. And then your heart, oh, this person is doing something wrong. Instead of khushu in Allah, you're more bothered about it. When the salah is over, then you, then you may start fighting with him. What's happened to the Muslim Ummah? If you see the examples of the people who have knowledge, and even today, I remember when we had called Sheikh Saud al Sharim, when Sheikh Saud al Sharim, the Imam of Haram, Al Makkah, when we invited him to Bombay for a conference, he came and we took him to various different mosques to offer salah. And once he was supposed to offer salah in one of the mosques for Asar. Now that group where this mosque was, they believed that a traveler, if he, you know, normally when you're traveling, you shorten your salah. Four rakat becomes two rakat. So, but that group believed that if a person who's a traveler leads the salah two rakat, then we cannot continue praying four rakat. And there was a discussion. Now Imam of Haram is coming. And then already agreed upon you now the time faster comes then i tell this to sheikh shurem that you know these people are having this he said no problem i will pray for akat because for a traveler to pray kasar shorten is mustab it's not fard but to create a fitna it is worse than murder so he said no problem if there's a problem in the mosque i will pray for akat even though i'm a traveler then the committee again got together They said, no, 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 no. Let Sheikh Shuram pray two rakat. We will pray for rakat. This is the hikmah. We don't fight over it. Imam of Haram is coming. He agrees with the view that a traveler should pay two rakat. And if a traveler is the imam, he prays two rakat kasar. The remaining people get up and stand. But he knew that to prevent a fitna, let a small loss take place to prevent a big loss. This is the usul of the sharia. Let a small loss take place to prevent a big loss. He may not be doing thing which is afzal. He's not doing musta, but he's preventing a fitna. Big fight in the Muslim ummah. Fitna is worse than even murder. So see these people who are with knowledge, but we, what we do, we'll fight over it, thinking that we are great scholars. And we will quote this hadith and that hadith and try and prove I'm right, you are bidah. What's happened to the Muslim Ummah? And you can give several such examples. We know that there is a hadith and the difference of opinion that if a person who is in wudu, if he eats camel meat, the wudu breaks. So one group of people believe that if you eat camel's meat, your wudu breaks. There's one group of scholars who believe that the wudu doesn't break. So imagine if you are called for a walima or for dinner and you have that dinner and in the dinner there's camel meat served and you want to offer salah. Maybe one Muslim may go and do wudu. The other say that my wudu is not broken. I will continue. If you believe your wudu is broken, okay, go and do your wudu and come back. But that doesn't mean if your other Muslim brother believes that the wudu is not broken, you will force him to do wudu. And what if he happens to be the imam? Ha! Ah, his imam did not do wudu. I cannot pray behind him. Sheikh Muhammad Saleh ibn Uthaymin, he says, I believe that the wudu breaks. But if I'm with the Muslims and there's another Muslim brother of mine who believes that the wudu doesn't break and if he's the imam, I will pray behind him. I will not say, okay, wudu is not there. And without wudu, salah is not there. And how can, and if he's the imam, my salah is not accepted. This is how the scholars think. But unfortunately, we common Muslims, we fight over small minor issues. All these issues are minor. You may have your view. Do research, alhamdulillah. Follow what you think is absurd. Please do it. I'm not telling you don't do research. What you believe is right, do proper research, do your istihad, 
If it's right, Allah will give you two sawab. If it's wrong, Allah will give you one sawab. But please don't create a fitna in the Muslim ummah. Don't fight over each other. Don't abuse each other. Don't call one another kafir. On small issues. One may ask me, Brother Zakir, if it's a thing of akhida, if it's a major thing, what to do? If it's a thing of akhida, if it's a major thing, something to do with ibadah, I will tell, okay. If I see a Muslim, I can do islah. But there is way of how to do islah. I will call him to Quran and the hadith of Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wasallam. I will not call him towards me. I will call him to Allah and his Rasul. The common factor uniting all the Muslims of the world is the glorious Quran and the hadith of Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wasallam. That's it. Call him towards it. I am aware that there are differences of opinion. There are. But most of the differences are minor differences. It's not worth fighting over. If it's a major issue, yes, you should do your research. You do your thing. And you may stick to your decision, alhamdulillah, you have to. And if you really want to get someone to the straight path, you can ask him three basic questions. Ask him. That what you are saying, are you on truth? Are you on haq? And but naturally that Muslim will say, yes. What I am saying, I am on haq. Ask him, that did you come on haq directly or did you do research? He will say, okay, I did research, no problem. Ask him the second question. Do you want to be on haq? And he will say, yes, I want to be on haq. Third question, are you a masum? Are you sinless? Do you never make mistakes? If you the Muslim, you'll have to say that I'm not Muslim. I'm a human being, I can make mistakes. That's it. You may give your proof, you may give your dalil, but do it with hikmah and husna, not fighting over each other. And there is a time when you should be given. Then you can give your dalil. And if we differ, we agree to disagree. We agree to disagree. Not that you have to agree with what your other Muslim brother is saying if you think it is wrong. Agree to disagree. But don't fight over it. That doesn't mean, okay, fine, I don't agree with him that because, because he's shaking his finger in the salah and if someone else comes and criticizes him, I will go and join hands with him. These are all, most of them are minor issues. If it's a major issue, okay, you can tell them. But if they disagree, you don't have to fight over it. We agree to disagree. And all the four IMAs and all the top scholars that you see, all the top scholars, they always said, all the four IMAs also, Imam Abu Hanifa, Imam Malik, Imam Shafi, Imam Ibn Hanbal, may, may Allah have mercy on all of them. Rahimullah. All of them said that if you find my opinion, if you find my fatwa, which goes against Allah, against the Quran, or against the teachings of Sayyid Hadith, then you reject my fatwa. Ignore my opinion. If you find any Sayyid Hadith of the Prophet, that is my opinion. Even though they differed, they respected each other's opinion. And today, we find this, I gave you an example only of talking about something about the issues of small issues of fiqh. Other things are there. There are Muslims that are divided because of social issues. Muslims that are divided because of political issues. Muslims that are divided because of business issues. Can, because of business, can you be against any other Muslim brother? Can you? Our beloved Prophet Muhammad said in Sahih Bukhari, volume 1, hadith number 13, a 
A believer is not a true believer until he wants for his Muslim brother what he wants for himself. Here if the Muslims are competing in business, you would want to be better than him. And to be better than him, you will join hands with the unbeliever to put him down in business to cause loss to your Muslim brother. Allah Akbar. Our beloved Prophet Muhammad said that the Muslim believers, they are like different parts of a building and clasped his hand like that. In Sahih Bukhari, one number three, hadith number two, four, four, six. They are so close to each other. We may differ, you may, he may be opponent in business, no problem. He may be opponent, maybe can academics, maybe in sports, but that doesn't mean that to put your opponent to the Muslim down, you join hands with the enemies just so that you get a medal or you get more profit. And this is common throughout the Muslim world that you're seeing. Today, I believe the maximum disunity that you find in the full Muslim history are these days. And it is deteriorating going from bad to worse. Allah says in the Quran, in Surah al Imran, chapter number 3, verse 104, let there arise out of you a band of people that invite people to the good and forbid them from doing wrong. These are the ones that shall attain felicity. Here Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is talking about a band of duats. How we are full-time doctors, full-time engineers, full-time lawyers. Allah is talking about full-time da'i, those who invite people towards the good. And forbid them from doing wrong. These are the ones that shall attain felicity. A higher level in Jannah. Allah says in next verse in Surah Imran chapter 3 verse 105. And those who divide amongst themselves. And the dispute after the Messiah has been made clear. They shall receive a severe punishment. Those who divide among themselves and create discord after the signs have been made clear to you, they will receive a severe punishment. Allah says in the Quran in Surah Anam, chapter number 6, verse number 159, If anyone divides his religion into sex, O Prophet, you have nothing to do with him. Allah will take care of his affairs and Allah will tell him the truth. That means if any Muslim divides his religion into sects, Allah tells the Prophet, you have nothing to do with him. And Allah will look after his affairs. That means making division in the deen and making sects in the deen is prohibited. And this has been mentioned in several places in the Quran. Allah says in Surah Rum, chapter number 30, verse number 31 and 32. That, O oh you believe, remember Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and fear him. And regularly pray and be not like those who join gods with Allah and divide the religion for if you do that you will receive a severe punishment Allah says in the Quran in Surah Anfal chapter number 8 verse number 46 Atullah wa Rasul obey Allah and obey the messenger and divide not your religion and if you divide you will lose your vanquer, your strength, and your courage. There are several verses in the Quran talking about the brotherhood of the Muslim Ummah. Allah says in the Quran in Surah Ambiya, chapter number 21, verse number 92, that verily your brotherhood is a single brotherhood. I am your Lord and cherisher. So serve me and no one else. Allah repeats the message in Surah Mu'minun, chapter number 23, verse number 52. That verily you are a single brotherhood. I am your Lord and cherisher. And fear me and no one else. Allah says in Surah Hujurat, chapter number 49, verse number 10. That the believers 
are verily one single brotherhood. All the believers, they are one single brotherhood. And try and make peace and reconciliation between the two contending parties. That means if among the Muslims, two groups of Muslims, if there is some dispute, make peace and reconciliation and Allah will be merciful on you. Allah says in the Quran in Surah Tawbah chapter number 9 verse number 71. Wal mu'minuna wal mu'minat. Ba'dum all yabad. The believing men and women, they are protectors unto one another. And they enjoin people to the good and forbid them from doing wrong. They offer regular prayers. They give regular charity. And they obey Allah and they obey the messenger. These are the ones that will get a great reward. Allah says in the Quran that the believing men and women, they are protectors and supporters unto one another. Do we find that today? Very few. Allah says in the Quran in Surah Maida chapter number 5, verse number 2. Help each other in piety and righteousness. Attan al birr taqwa. Help each other in piety and righteousness. And help not each other in sin and in transgression. That means we Muslims should help each other in birr and taqwa. In piety and righteousness. But do not help each other in sin and in transgression. The major uniting factor for the Muslim Ummah is the glorious Quran and the Sahih Hadith. It is the duty of every Muslim that you should obey Allah and obey the Messenger. Allah says very clearly in several places in the Quran, Atiullah wa Atiur Rasul. Obey Allah and obey the Messenger. In Surah Imran, chapter number 3, verse number 32. In Surah Imran, chapter number 3, verse number 132. In Surah Nisa, chapter number 4, verse number 13. In Surah Nisa, chapter number 4, verse number 59. In Surah Nisa, chapter number 4, verse number 69. In Surah Maida, chapter number 5, verse number 92. In Surah Anfal, chapter number 8, verse number 1. In Surah Anfal, chapter number 8, verse number 20. In Surah Anfal, chapter number 8, verse number 46. In Surah Tawba, chapter number 9, verse number... 71. In Surah Nur, chapter number 24, verse number 52. In Surah Nur, chapter number 24, verse number 54. In Surah Azab, chapter 33, verse number 33. In Surah Azab, chapter number 33, verse number 71. In Surah Muhammad, chapter number 47, verse number 33. In Surah Ujura, chapter number 49, verse number 14. In Surah Mujadila, chapter number 58, verse number 13. In Surah Taghaboon, chapter number 64, verse number 12. In several places, Allah says, Atiullah, wa Atiur Rasul. Obey Allah and obey the Messenger. It is the duty of every Muslim that he should obey Allah and obey the messenger. If we only follow these two things, all the fitna will be removed. Only two things. We hold fast to the rope of Allah and be not divided. Allah says in Surah, Surah Al Imran, chapter number 3, verse number 31, O Prophet, say, if you love Allah, obey me. Allah will love you and Allah will forgive you. For Allah is of forgiving and most merciful. Wallahu ghafur rahim Allah says in Surah Azab chapter number 33 verse number 36. It is not befitting for any believer, whether man or woman, that when Allah and his Rasul has made a decision that you should have any other opinion. And if you disobey Allah and his messenger, the wrath of Allah will come on you. The verse of the Quran is very clear. In Surah Azab, chapter number 33, verse number 36, it is not befitting for any believer, whether men or women, that once Allah and his messenger have made a decision that you should have any other opinion besides that. And if anyone who disobeys Allah, the wrath 
of Allah. Allah and His Rasul, the wrath of Allah will come. So where is the difference? We Muslims should be united. Allah says in the Quran in Surah Maida, chapter number 5, verse number 72. Allah says in the Quran, in Surah Maida, chapter number 5, verse number 97, that take what the Prophet gives you and abstain from what he prohibits you from. Allah says in Surah Araf, chapter 7, verse 57, that take what the Prophet gives you and abstain from what he prohibits you. And a beloved Prophet ﷺ said, it's mentioned in a Sahih Hadith of Abu Dawud, volume number 5, Hadith number 4596, a beloved Prophet ﷺ said, that the Jews were divided into 71 or 72 sects, the Christians were divided into 71 or 72 sects, and my Ummah will be divided into 73 sects. The next Hadith, also a Sahih Hadith of Abu Dawud, Word number five, hadith number four, five, nine, seven. Our beloved Prophet Muhammad said that the people of the book, the Jews and the Christians, they were divided into 72 sects. And my ummah will be divided into 73 sects. 72 will go to hell and one will go to paradise, Jannah. The one that will follow the Jamaah, the one that will follow the main body of the Muslim ummah. There's another hadith, also a Sahih hadith, in Jami Tirmidhi, word number five, hadith number 2640, the beloved Prophet said that the Jews were divided into 71 or 72 sects. The Christians were divided into a similar number. My Ummah will be divided into 73 sects. The next hadith of Jami Tirmidhi, word number five, hadith number 2641 our beloved Prophet said that there will be a time when my ummah will follow the people of Bani Israel and when the people of Bani Israel when they do zina with their mother in the open one person from my community will do the same Note the words of the Prophet. A time will come when my people will follow the people of Bani Israel. When they do zina with their mother in the open, one person from my community will do the same. And then the Prophet said that the Bani Israel were divided into 71 or 72 sects. My Ummah will be divided into 73 sects. All will go to hell except one will go to paradise. And the narrator of the hadith, Abdullah ibn Umar, may Allah be pleased with him, he asks, O Prophet, who are they? Who will go to paradise? He said, those that are with me and my companions, those which are on the path of Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wasallam and the sahabas. Imagine our beloved Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. He's predicting there will be 73 sects. The Prophet didn't say mix sects. Allah says don't mix sects. Haram. But the Prophet predicted even though Allah said don't mix sects, my ummah is going to be divided into 73 sects. All will go to hell except one. That which follows the main body, the jama, and that which is on the path, of the Rasul and the Sahabas. Imagine, out of 73 sects, 72 will go to hell. And all of us Muslims, yeah, we are the people that will go to paradise. Only way you can be the people who will go to Jannah is if you follow the Sunnah of the Prophet and that of the Sahabas. You follow the Hadith as per the understanding of the Sahabas. Our beloved Prophet Muhammad said, it's mentioned in Sahih Bukhari, volume number 8, hadith number 6011, 
our beloved prophet said that the believers they love one another they are merciful to one another and they are kind to one another they are like one body if one part gets sick then the whole body is sleepless and in fever that means if any one of the muslim brother is harmed the full muslim ummah should be in trouble that's what the prophet meant today we find there are many of the muslim brothers of ours in different parts of the world they are suffering and what are the other muslims doing i know that most of the muslims can't do much besides doing dua which is the least we can do but there are muslims who can speak and they don't speak there are muslims who can help and they don't help today allah has given us muslims wealth at the time of the prophet the sahabas overall were very poor today we have the black gold the richest people in the world today are the muslims they may not be on the forbes list because all of them have personal wealth the forbes list is only that is which is listed companies private companies are not on the forbes list according to me the hundred richest people most of them will be in the gulf country almost all i personally know muslims who can have 10 10 bill gates in their pocket personally i know many of them what what is the state of the muslim ummah today we are using that money to help the enemies of islam to attack the muslims we are using that money to bribe the enemies of islam to fight against our muslim enemies if we know a final goal is akhira allah says in the quran that if you want this dunya allah will give you this dunya but will not give you akhira surah baqarah chapter 2 verse number 200 next verse surah baqarah chapter 2 verse 201 allah says those are the people who say rabbana atina fid dunya hasnatan wa fil akhirati hasnatan wa qina nar that oh my lord give us the good in this world and the akhira and save us from the torment of hell fire if we really know the sunnah of the beloved prophet muhammad sallallahu alaihi wasallam we will not care for this wealth we will not care for this money our beloved prophet muhammad sallallahu alaihi wasallam said the two rak'ah sunnah that you offer before your fajr fajr for salah it is more valuable than the earth and the wealth in it so every true muslim is thousand times more richer than bill gates right or wrong but if we have faith in our prophet how many of us have A beloved prophet said if you offer the two raka sunnah before the fajr salah it is more valuable than the earth and the wealth in it so if we follow allah and his rasul atiy allah atiy rasul and if our main aim is akhirah no one can disturb the muslim but the problem is Allah says in the Quran the wealth will be a test and a trial for you your children will be a test and a trial for you so Allah is testing and our beloved prophet said i am not so much bothered about about poverty in my community i am bothered about the wealth when my community gets wealth and that is what's happening today the prophet said he is more afraid when my community will be rich he is not afraid when the community will be poor that there is in the prophet said it is easier for a poor man to go to jannah than a rich man the wealth is the fifth night the test for you and we muslims we should mind it you should be united on the basis of Allah and his Rasul. And a beloved Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam said, it's mentioned in Jami Tirmidhi, Sayyid Hadith, volume number four, Hadith number 2166, that Allah's hand will be over the Jama'ah, means the main body. 
next hadith Jami Tirmidhi point number 4 hadith number 2167 says that Allah's hand will be over the jama and Allah will never let the ummah be united on a disagreement never be united on a thing which is wrong Allah will never let the ummah unite on thing which is wrong we Muslims should be united on the banner of the Quran and say hadith instead of calling us that I am so and so and so and so you know people give themselves label I'm a better Muslim I'm the one going to go to Jannah and they give themselves label X Y Z the best label you can give is the label given by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and that is Qala inna ni minal muslimin say that I'm a Muslim Allah says in the Quran in Surah Imran chapter number 3 verse number 52 that when Isa alayhi salam told the Ansar who, who is going to be the Ansar told his followers they said we will be Ansars of Allah and we are Muslims Allah says in Surah Imran chapter 3 verse 67 that it says that Ibrahim alayhi salam was not a Jew or a Christian but he was a Muslim Allah says in Surah Imran chapter number 3 verse 64 come to common terms as between us and you which is the first term Allah na'buda illallah that we worship none but Allah wala nushika bihi shayyon that we associate to partner with him wala yattakhiz abad dun abad dun arabab and mindun illah that we erect not among ourselves lords and patrons other than Allah fa in tawallaw if they turn back fa kulu shadu say ye bear witness bi anna muslimoon that we are muslims bowing our will to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala the label Allah has given us is muslims if someone asks you what are you you should say you are a muslim instead of giving a label the best label you can give yourself is the label given by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala muslim and the best profession you can follow is profession of calling people towards Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala Allah says in the Quran in Surah Fusilat, chapter number 41, verse number 33, Woman ahsanu kala mimman doila lahi, wa amil salihaum, kala inna nimil al muslimin, who is better in speech than one who invites to the way of thy Lord, works righteousness, and says that I am a Muslim. I would like to end my speech with the quotation of the glorious Quran, which appears in the Quran in no less than three different places. In Surah Tawbah, chapter 9, verse number 33. In Surah Fatah, chapter number 48, verse number 28. And Surah Saf, chapter number 61, verse number 9. Allah says, Huwa allazi arsala rasulahu bilhuda wa ad-din al-haq liyuzira wa ala ad-din kulli. That Allah sent his messenger with guidance and the religion of truth so that it will prevail over all the other religions, over all the other ways of life. And Allah ends by saying that وَقَفَى بِاللَّهِ شَيْدَ and enough is Allah as a witness and in two places Allah says that هُوَ الَّذِي أَرْسَلَ رَسُولَهُ بِلُدَى وَالدِّينُ الْحَقِّ لِيُذْهِرَ وَالدِّينِ كُلِّ that Allah has sent his messenger with guidance and the religion of truth so that it will prevail over all the other religions over all the other isms وَلَوْ قَرْهِ الْمُشْرِكُونَ how might the mushrik don't like it and my, and my talk with this verse of the Quran وآخر الدعوان الحمد لله رب العالمين